Today's um, panelists are John Bowman, our Executive Vice President, Stephen Novakovich, um, CFA Charter Holder and Managing Director of the CHI Curriculum, and myself, Miran Decker, I'm the Director of Candidate and Member Relations. Please, please, please add your questions to the Q&A section, because ultimately you drive this conversation. Um, we want to make sure that you walk away with actionable items and a potential plan to sit for your CHIA exam. Um, we will share a, rec a recording of this webinar on Friday um, in a follow-up email um, on the email that you used to register for this webinar. And with that, I'm going to hand over the mic to John. Thanks, Miriam. And so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are located, whatever time zone you're in. Uh, looks like people are still streaming in, but I know in at least the registration group, we had a very diverse geographically uh, job type uh, and uh, of all flavors and sizes. So really glad that you're going to spend a few minutes with us. As Miriam just alluded to, I want to be abundantly clear in reinforcing that we hope this is just a conversation, just an informal conversation. That's why we've labeled it Ask Us Anything. Throw the hard ones, the easy ones uh, at us. We want to be a resource for you. So this is us having a cup of coffee at a cafe and just chatting. Uh, obviously, there were submissions on questions that you were particularly interested in. We'll try to hit a couple of those, but Steve, Miriam, and I are going to be fairly brief in our prepared comments with the hope that we move into back and forth interaction um, for the bulk of this session. Uh, my job um, is not to stand here and sell you on anything. I want to be abundantly clear that the goal of today is not to try to contrive or manufacture a registration. We are a professional body, and we want um, to ensure that you understand what it means to be a professional, why Kaya and the Kaya credential, we think, play a, a role, a small role in the broader ecosystem of, of creating professionals, and why our community and our exam could be the right fit for you. So uh, we're going to be doing mostly clarifying and unveiling and uh, maybe a little bit of inspiration, but I, I, I don't want you to think we're here to sell uh, that is not our mission and is certainly not our, our motivation. A couple of things I just want to say before I pass it to Steve, who is going to walk through a little bit of kind of the what to expect uh, in your study experience, your exam experience. Um, and, and that is, first of all, uh, why? what is Kaya trying to accomplish? Why, why do we exist? Why are we maybe different than other organizations that are trying to contribute to that same professionalization I just alluded to? Um, and, and I want to hit on two things. First is the growth of alternatives. And first of all, maybe even defining alternatives. In the greatest of ironies, I don't like the use of alternatives. Now, the unfortunate thing is that's the second letter in our name, uh, the Chartered Alternative Investment Analyst Association. If we were starting over today, we probably wouldn't name it that because 21 years ago, these were very alternative. They were very idiosyncratic. And, and 21 years ago, the, the solutioning we were trying to do when we birthed the idea of Kaya was to try to help investors think through how do they take a traditional 60-40 portfolio, publicly traded stocks and bonds, and integrate what was then all these weird, uh, unconstrained equity strategies that, of course, we now call hedge funds. Now, fast forward 21 years, and we've got private capital of all shapes and sizes, private debt, private equity across all stratifications, buyout, growth, venture capital. We've got infrastructure. We've got capabilities and wrappers uh, and structures where you can invest directly into uh, natural resources and real estate of all uh, segments. And so our curriculum is meant to cover everything out of that conventional publicly traded equity and debt. Um, we're here to equip you to build diversified portfolios. And if you take a look at where the world is going from an assets under management perspective, we Kaya recently did a study, we do this fairly often, just to kind of capture or paint uh, the picture of what the total global investable universe is. Uh, and on rough numbers in US dollars, that's about 153 trillion of investable assets globally. About 18, uh, sorry, about 12% of that, or 18 trillion US, is devoted to what we call alternatives. That's hedge funds, private capital, real estate, uh, infrastructure, as I said. Uh, when we expect, and I think most expect, that that 12% probably goes 
uh, to upwards of 20% or more in the next 10 years. And so what does that mean for us? What does that mean for the repositioning of your career, your expertise, your competency set? Uh, because the clients are demanding it, the market is demanding it, uh, and uh, we believe, hence our slogan, Portfolio for the Future, that we need to prepare for a different future than the past several decades. And so diversification is here to stay. Sophisticated portfolio construction is one where there are multiple units uh, and asset allocations. Um, I, I think uh, clearly the 60-40 is dead argument is not a good one. It's, it's reductionist. And uh, the reality is diversification is better than no diversification. And so three or four or five asset classes or exposures or risk factors, depending on how you want to look at it, is better than two. That's the way we like to think about it. And so portfolios for the future are going to require and demand a much broader set of tools to deliver on investment outcomes for your client. The other thing I wanted to mention, which I've kind of alluded to uh, in the origin story I told a moment ago, is that back 21 years when, as I said, we were trying to solve or help these investors that were perplexed with, what do I do with these unconstrained strategies, uh, is that we've always attempted to put our, uh, our candidates in what I like to call the flight simulator or the cockpit of the allocator. Uh, and that doesn't mean that uh, we are assuming you have aspirations to be in an asset owner seat or already are in an asset owner seat. But this is critical for the Kaya perspective and lens on how you're going to learn and, and the, the perspective on which we teach the curriculum and test you on the examination is that we want to put you in, in, the, in the seat of an allocator so that you have empathy and understanding of what it means to be a capital allocator across all of these different asset classes that I've, I've alluded to. Now, the majority of our candidates are sitting, as you probably are, in GP roles, in traditional asset management organizations, in consultants and service providers. Uh, so again, by no means are we deluded to think that all of you have aspirations. That's not the goal of the Kayak program. But the goal is to bring more clarity to that broader picture of trade-offs and dilemmas at the top of the value chain that investors or asset owners are faced with constantly. It's gonna help you if you're just, for example, if you're a GP selling a real estate strategy, it's really gonna help you uh, for the individual across the table, the CIO, when she is listening to your pitch, for you to have empathy and understanding and cognizance of the trade-offs that she will have to determine, think through, and ultimately decide upon on whether that private debt strategy or infrastructure strategy or real estate strategy is the right one. For her portfolio. Uh, and so that, that is the goal of the Kai Association, thinking like an allocator, putting you in the seat of the allocator and really explaining that. So I'm going to stop there from the perspective of kind of what is Kai about and what are we hoping to accomplish? Uh, we are here to build a professional community. We've got 13,000 Kaya's now in 100 plus countries, uh, and I'm excited to see that growing. Uh, rapidly and showing a lot of vivacious energy towards being part of something bigger than yourself in this Kaya community. Uh, but with that, I think I'm going to hand it off to Steve. Steve is uh, our Managing Director of Curriculum. And maybe, Steve, before we get into some lively Q&A, you could just talk a little bit about, as some of the questions that were pre-submitted suggested, what should I expect once I hit that register button and uh, fully commit Right. What should I expect from a study experience commitment leading up to exam day? Perfect. And uh, for the people who have joined since we started, please uh, continue putting questions in the Q and A. And I have some very brief remarks, and then we'll 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 try to go through as many of the questions as possible that are that are in there. But uh, with that, yeah, John, thanks for the queuing me up there. Uh, so as you mentioned, John, um, th you know the history of of Kaya was a focus on uh, the alt universe broadly from an um, institutional allocator's perspective. Um, so focusing on investments that um, had that sort of uh, institutional credibility, if that's the right way of putting it. And so our first level walks you through those variety of institutional investments uh, that are not bonds and not stocks, private debt, private equity, real estate, other real assets, hedge funds. And that's really where the level one focus is on, is just familiarizing the candidates with the variety of alternative investments that exist, 
as well as the tools that you need to be able to sort of uh, wrap your arms around those. And by those tools, I mean the fundamentals tools of economics, statistics, other quant quantitative foundational uh, material. And so um, that's where level one focus is. But as, as John, you mentioned, uh, there's more more to investing than just being aware of what a venture capital fund is or being aware of what a convertible arbitrage fund is. There's putting it all together into a portfolio context and all the other elements around that. And that's where level two comes into play. And level two is where we really are speaking to the institutional allocator in particular, where we talk about portfolio construction uh, using uh, asset allocation and portfolio optimization techniques. We talk about risk management. We talk about due diligence practices. We talk about the different ways you access alternative investments, whether it be through liquid alts or some other kind of fund structures and means and so forth. We talk a little bit also about some other kind of complex strategies and a variety of different things. And so the curriculum really uh, speaks to uh, the audience of that institutional asset allocator. But to your point, John, um, the way, you'd, the way I kind of really think about it is, uh, without sounding a little bit too um, uh, uh, simplistic around it, the reason why a hedge fund or a real estate fund or a private equity fund exists is because there is an institutional allocator that has money to give to them. And if institutional allocators didn't exist, there wouldn't be that much money around for a private equity fund to do its thing. And so there's this whole ecosystem, whether it be regulators or service providers or the GPs, that exists because of limited partners. And so our perspective is that uh, that ecosystem is benefited by understanding how limited partners operate, think, uh, engage in best practices, build portfolios, conduct due diligence. And so if I'm a manager at a hedge fund portfolio, I wanna know how limited partners engage with me. I wanna know how limited partners evaluate me. I wanna know what kind of strategies they're looking for and how I fit into their portfolio. So you're not gonna take Kaya and learn how to read balance sheets and create Excel models uh, for a long short portfolio of two companies. That's not what our uh, curriculum covers and that's not our, what we're attempting to, uh, to teach. We're not attempting to teach you to be the next hedge fund analyst. We're attempting to have you be aware of all the different types of alternative investments that exist, how those strategies are generally constructed. So what it means to have a long short trade, what it means to have a convertible arbitrage trade, what kind of companies venture capitalists are looking for and investing in, but we're not trying to teach you the underlying models necessarily and, and the analytics uh, behind that, that's uh, uh, and, and the accounting statements and so forth. And then we're trying to teach you how that all fits within a portfolio, how that how people uh, conduct diligence on those investors and, and, and so on and so forth. So with, with that, then the question is, what do you then experience on the exams? Um, so with our first level, uh, it's exclusively a multiple choice uh, exam process, uh, 200 questions spread over several hours um, uh, for the, the entire material. And then when you enter into level two, it's 100 multiple choice questions for half of it. And then the other half is uh, constructed response questions where we'll give you some vignettes and ask you to uh, uh, give some written responses uh, around those uh, that material. And uh, the other thing that is unique about our second level is that in addition to our quote unquote core curriculum, we also have a variety of rotating emerging topics uh, or articles that are written externally uh, that we think are really uh, insightful and appropriate for our, our candidates to, to read and, and get further uh, learning on topics that are not uh, covered in depth or detail uh, within our uh, existing curriculum. And so uh, you'll see uh, written responses or constructed response questions around those as well. Lastly, I'll touch on kind of uh, the study uh, techniques and questions people have, and then and then I'll, I'll we'll dive into all the questions that are in the system right now. So everyone's studying is different. Uh, there is no one right answer to this. Uh, on average, our candidates suggest they spend anywhere from 200 to 300 hours studying for these exams. Everyone's experiences are going to be different. Um, I am a Kaya charter holder. Um, my my career before Kaya, I was at an institutional investor, so I had some degree of familiarity with a lot of the um, strat alternative investments to begin with. So for me, as I was reading through the level one material, I said, "Oh, great! I already have an understanding of venture capital funds." So that was a little bit more familiar for me, um, and so maybe I didn't have to spend as much time as somebody who didn't have that level of familiarity. So it really kind of depends on what lens you're coming from. That being said, what I would say is one of the things that we're very clear and transparent around is that 
our curriculum is built around uh, learning objectives. And what we mean by that is there are clear things that we want our candidates to take away as they're going through the curriculum. We want them to be able to say that they understand the dynamics of ABC or they know how to apply XYZ. And we, we have all those learning objectives uh, listed at the beginning of every section. And furthermore, our exams team creates their questions uh, exclusively and explicitly around those learning objectives. Every single question is going to link back to some learning objective. So when you're studying, the way I really kind of would, would suggest you go about doing it is, you know, you read the material, you make sure you understand what's in there, you see what you know and what you don't know, and, and so the areas that are less familiar, maybe you spend a little bit more time reading. But when you're done reading that section, go back and take a look at those learning objectives and say, all right, great, Kaya wanted me to be able to uh, take away these three, five, whatever items. After having read this, do I feel like I can say with confidence that I can uh, answer those learning objectives or say that I have a comprehension or demonstrate knowledge of those learning objectives? And that's kind of going to be your North Star every for every reading that you go through. We also put together something we just call a study guide, which is essentially just a list of all those hundreds of learning objectives uh, for both levels. So after you're done reading through all the material, you can go back to our study guide and just look down that list of learning objectives and say, all right, check, I, I feel comfortable with that one. Check, I feel comfortable with that one. Oh, this is one where I say, oh, you know what? I don't know that I actually have my um, a grasp of that. Let me go back to that material and make sure that I can say, yes, I you know, understand how to apply this particular concept or so forth. So um, what I would advise to folks is that our questions are derived from those learning objectives. So just evaluate whether or not you feel like you have uh, mastered the material associated with those specific uh, learning objectives that we have uh, throughout uh, our curriculum. Um, we offer a free sample exam to all of our candidates. So certainly take advantage of that, take that sample exam. It gives you an opportunity to see what questions written by our exams team looks like and feel like, um, and, and you get a, a chance to take advantage of that. We do have prep providers that we uh, have formal relationships with. Um, if you feel like you need extra resources to help you with your studying, certainly take a look at those. Uh, there's a variety of options available with different types of resources and you can choose the one that offers the resources that are appropriate for you. Um, you know, we don't endorse one over another, but uh, we have several of those partners. Not all candidates use prep hey, providers. Steve. Yeah. Hey, Steve, uh, I just yeah. was answering that exact question on yeah. prep providers. That's yeah. listed on our site, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and not all of our candidates use prep providers. It's, it's a personal choice. We have plenty of candidates that use our curriculum as their sole source of studying and are more than uh, successful in, in passing uh, the exams. And, and that means it just comes down to your own kind of personal needs, your own style of studying and so forth. Um, you know, the last thing I'll say, too, this is my own uh, personal uh, experience going through all these things is. I, I, there's a huge volume of material, right? Level one, level two are thousands of pages each. Half the battle is just understanding what's in there and then figuring out what you really need to kind of key in on and focus in on um, and coming back to that at a later point of time. Uh, and so I really think starting a little bit early so that you can get through all the material and then have a chance to go back and review some of the more technical things or newer things uh, later on is really valuable. I also certainly personally found flashcards to be particularly helpful. I wrote down equations on flashcards and used those to help me memorize them. 30% of our exam, let me phrase that, at most 30% of your exam will be quantitative. So you will be bringing a calculator with you to an exam. You will be expected to have formulas memorized. We do have a handful of formulas that we make explicitly clear that you do not have to memorize. But the vast majority of formulas we do anticipate you needing to memorize or make it clear you need to memorize. And for me, flashcards are really helpful with, with that process. Um, and so that's a technique that worked really well for me, but everyone everyone is different. Um, John, I know there was a question there about kind of what, what pass rates look like. So maybe since I'm talking about exams, we can go to that one and then we can go through uh, more of these uh, one-off then, but... Yeah, no, I answered the uh, the the pass rates uh, directly, so that's in the Q and A. You can follow up if you've got further questions. I I put a link in there just for the time series. A couple of them that I wanted to answer live though that are a little bit more nuanced. Um, 
Uh, one is um, on kind of difficulty or your, ex your the challenges if you don't have experience in certain areas, how should you think about pri prioritizing your study? So uh, let me try to hit a few of those and Steve jump in uh, and, and add where appropriate. So uh, a couple things. First of all, as Steve kind of alluded to, it's critical to reinforce that there is one curriculum and then there are third party prep programs. The, the curriculum that we uh, commission and write and produce and distribute is the only resource that our exam team looks at to defend and legitimize and support every single exam question that you'll see. So really, really important. There are not several options that you can study with. There is one option, and then there are third party supplemental options. As I, as I answered in one of the questions, there are several out there, as Steve said, uh, and we don't endorse one over another other than the ones that we have listed have at least gone through some screening. So you can, I think, be assured that they're at least using our material to prepare their prep uh, program. Uh, from a background perspective, the curriculum does not assume that you are uh, an expert in hedge funds, in alternative investments, uh, in any particular, e even have many years of finance acumen. Um, it certainly it expects some working basic knowledge of finance and economics, uh, but uh, you should rest assured that each of the asset classes is kind of approached through a prism of someone just getting started in the area. So the level one is going to spend a lot of time on definition, characteristics, risk return, identity, uh, structure of how, if it's a fund, uh, of how these wrappers and structures work. So I I think you should not be intimidated if you come like I did from a very traditional background or a background uh, in just one asset class. Uh, that's the whole purpose of Kaya is to broaden your horizons and equip you to kind of dig in with some basic knowledge across all the asset classes. So that's that. Um, Steve, maybe you could take a um, combination of a couple here. Uh, the role of emerging topics, kind of where where you should hit that, and, and maybe partly relatedly, any differences in the way you should approach studying for level two versus level one? Yeah, uh, thanks for that. So, I mean, level two and level one, the experience is the same, with the exception, of course, of those emerging topic uh, papers, which are exclusively tested via constructed response. So to a degree, you could argue there is a little bit different of an experience as you prepare for those because you know they're not going to show up in a multiple choice question format instead they're going to be one where you're going to be writing to I would say the way you would study for those is similarly the same we create learning objectives even though we don't write that material we create learning objectives based on that material which again indicates the areas that we want you to sort of take away um, and, and and learn from those readings so again I would still say that those learning objectives are going to be your north star whether you read them first or last um, you know everyone's different um, I, I think it doesn't hurt to do it, read them more than once is kind of the way I'd sort of describe it. And again, maybe as you're reading those, you're taking notes relative to the learning objectives associated with that. Um, because some, some of those papers are a little bit longer. I mean, some might be 10 pages, but admittedly, some of them might be more like 30 pages. And, it, and so it, there might be stuff that you need to distill down. And so it could be that as you're reading through them, you have those learning objectives next to you and you kind of write the notes from those relative to those learning objectives. And then that's what you review, uh, you know, a second time as you get closer to the exam. So I, I don't want to ever just say there's a one size fit all for these things, but it it, it would probably be beneficial to read them um, more than once. Uh, and um, hopefully you find more of them to be a little more accessible, but there are a, one or two that might feel a little technical uh, and would definitely benefit from uh, reading more than once to just to get your arms around uh, that material. Stephen, for the emerging topics, maybe you can reference the videos that you have recorded. They're by no means uh, study material, but they can at least bring the curriculum a little bit to life for level two. Sure. Yeah. Also, there's a there's a question about uh, with the emerging topics as well. Does that uh, imply that external personal readings would be required to gain the knowledge to be able to respond to such questions? Uh, so so uh, we do not uh require people to um you don't need resources beyond whatever is within that external reading and so um uh if for example right now one of the external readings is about 
uh, cryptocurrencies and an introduction to cryptocurrencies. Um, you're certainly obviously welcome if you want to explore that uh, world beyond what's in that paper. The questions will be based off of what's in there. And we believe the concepts that are in there are written in a way that do not require sort of additional X outside material. Um, so that's something that we're trying to be very careful about that 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 uh, to, to synthesize the material, you would need to read something else in addition to what's assigned. Um, similar to our own curriculum, we hope that those ex uh, external readings are self-contained, if that's a good way of putting it. Uh, but that being said, uh, as Mira mentioned, um, we do have uh, resources that are not required, but designed to hopefully help make those readings a little bit more accessible uh, in the form of uh, author interviews. I interviewed the authors of all of our uh, emerging topic readings uh, and to talk specifically about that material. I will be very clear, watching those videos is not a substitute for reading the material. If you watch those videos and then think you can sit down and take the exam and answer the questions about those readings because of watching those videos, not the case at all. But you know, read the reading first. And then if you feel like you have a little bit of confusion around the reading or trying to understand the application of it a little bit better, the videos hopefully help bring that to life a little bit more uh, for you. Um, so that is a resource that we have available for those. A related question that came in, and it may have been answered, but it's worth worth pointing out, is what resources does Kaya have to support candidates uh, in their studying process? Uh, obviously, every candidate has access to our curriculum, but beyond that, what are the resources? The reality of it is, is that this is really a process that's self-guided. Uh, the candidates are really the ones responsible for figuring out how to find the time and, and, and space and, and process for studying uh, the material. It may be that you use a prep provider to help you with that, but, but beyond the curriculum, and then what we call our study guide, which is really just simply the list of our learning objectives, Kaya doesn't have any other formal study tools or prep tools for our candidates. Um, we do have some of those limited you know, video type elements that are not necessarily um, designed to replace the material, but maybe just sort of supplemental. Um, but really, this is something where it's it's um, the candidate's responsibility to uh, really take it on. And if the candidate needs additional resources, that's where the prep providers uh, come into play. I'm going to take a couple of these as well um, and keep them coming. These are great. Um, I, I've touched on this a little bit, but there's a question about what percentage of candidates use the actual curriculum versus partner materials. Um, Frankly, this was a bit of a flaw in our business model that we have tried to uh, fix over the last two years. So now if you register, uh, you get the kayak curriculum included with your registration. So my answer to this question, hopefully, is 100% of candidates are now using the actual curriculum. People, uh, candidates historically, I think were a bit confused uh, on what resource they should use as, again, as if it's a multiple um, set of doorways, uh, any of which that are appropriate. So um, historically, I think it probably was maybe 60% uh, referenced it at some point, uh, but a large portion, maybe even that many also use third-party materials. Again, um, I use third-party party materials when I studied for the CFA, parts that I just really struggled with that I needed live instruction help. That is absolutely something that we would recommend. Um, but uh, but that that is at least the the data that we've got. Um, I think the other one uh, that I'll mention, very specific on kind of a emerging top or essays generally, uh, there's a there's a testing term a bit colloquial called double jeopardy, meaning if it's a two part question and you miss level one, are you automatically going to miss level two? And the answer is we don't do that. So each of those is independent. Now. To be clear, if you don't understand or, or if you're confused with a particular methodology or concept or calculation, it could impact uh, your ability to get the second part correct if you've missed the, the first, but they do not build on each other. So they are not dependent on each other. Uh, to answer if that. I could just add that to John as well. Um, if you sit for the level two exam and you sit for these constructive response questions, you will not be dinged on your level of English or your grammar. Um, we'll get it. 
if you have um, any calculations, we always encourage you to at least show us your journey um, to make sure that that is in there as well. And to yeah. John's point, a net, you know, low points on your um, first answer and high points on your second answer can be achieved. Um, the other thing that I want to be clear is if people, if the question relates to provide, you know, the top two benefits of X, Y, Z, don't give it, like you can give us a top, like your total five, but we will only look at the top two. Um, yeah. That prevents us from having to read through all your 10 answers. We will only, if the, if the question pertains to the top two, just give us your top two. Steve, uh, I think there's a couple of really good questions in here on a topic we discussed just yesterday and think about all the time, which is the conditions and the triggers upon which a topic or asset class or security is ready to be included in the CHIA curriculum. What is just a fad? What's a new shiny object, which of course we don't want to teach uh, or enable, uh, but what, at what point um, do we determine, how do we determine to include something? Yeah. And a related question that came up too was um, sort of the rise of the retail investor in alts. And so how do we, uh, how does what we do uh, align with that? And I think, um, so there's there's two elements there. Um, it is true that our focus is on institutional quality alternative investments. And it is also true, true that more and more of those investments are becoming available to retail investors. And so I think a big trend over the course of the next decade is that more and more retail investors will have investment portfolios that have access to alternative investments or alternative like investments, whether they be liquid alts or something else. And so I think that over the course of the decade, the Kaya designation or the Kaya material become increasingly relevant to retail investors or to people who, who cater to retail investors. Now, that being said, there are definitely investments that um, are uh, that are not quote unquote traditional, but are also very kind of retail centric. Uh, some examples of that might be uh, artwork or stamps or coins. Um, yes, those may fit in a definition of alternative, uh, but for us, uh, those are examples of ones that don't fall into that institutional quality. And the, the filter that we look at is things along the lines of the depth of the market, the size of the market, the scale of the market, and the representation of those assets within institutional portfolios. Um, and so when you look at something like coins and stamps, you're never going to see those in uh, pension plans or endowments because those are just not markets that can handle hundreds of millions of dollars of investment dollars. Um, and so that's a big factor for, for us. Uh, you know, digital, digital assets, cryptocurrencies, uh, that was a market that started at the retail level and certainly grew to a point that it could withstand or withstand if that's the right word, it could take on hundreds of millions of dollars in investments, but you didn't really see it represented in institutional portfolios until the last couple of years. So at this point now, we would absolutely describe uh, digital assets as being of institutional quality because they meet the de dual definition of having a market size, scale, depth that institutional money can actually be in it and institutions are investing in it. So those are the two really primary elements that you're going to be looking for in that regard. Um, you know, we do have some very, 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 very limited discussion on some of the smaller elements like visual works of art. But that is a, a very, um, it is more of just an acknowledgement or reference to those areas as opposed to any kind of emphasis uh, in, in the curriculum. Um, so that's, that's, that's how we look at what it means to be institutional and, and how things ultimately find their way into our uh, curriculum over time. So a few questions in, in here, perhaps just on some confusing semantics we've yeah. used or other credentialing organizations use. So I just want to be clear. Um, uh, so we have, uh, Kaya, as I said earlier, publishes the curriculum of which the exam is based on. That curriculum is going to be included in digital format for anyone that registers, whether you are a brand new candidate to that level or whether you are returning for a second try at that level. So you will have that in digital interactive form. Uh, the print version of that, which is identical, just in physical form, is also available for an extra cost. So, but there is no difference in the content and the flow of those two mediums. Uh, again, everyone will have the digital and you can 
upgrade to include to receive the print as well. The study guide uh, is different and is not the curriculum. I just want to be clear. The study guide is a bit of a handbook or a guide, a cheat sheet, you might say, that includes all the learning outcomes uh, and kind of the table of contents, to put it very simply. All of that material is also included in the curriculum. So the study guide is a bit of a reference sheet, uh, a shorthand reference sheet to the flow of the curriculum. Uh, but sits outside. And as I said, all those learning outcomes are embedded within the curriculum itself. So I hope that I hope that clears it up. A few questions in there. And yes, as I said, the, the program is designed that the curriculum is enough to pass the exam. Again, the exam is only based on the curriculum. But I would say just as emphatically, if you prefer other types of learning styles, if you need extra help on a subject that is particularly challenging, like I did, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are many other third-party prep programs that can help you with that. Yeah, John, there's a question in here about um, just what to expect from the short answer questions. Yeah. Um, so again, just like with our multiple choice questions, they are um, in, uh, explicitly linked to learning objectives. You're going to get irritated at me for keeping on bringing that up, but I'm trying to be as clear and transparent as possible. Our exams teams looks at the learning objectives and then write questions about them. They're either multiple choice questions or they are short answer questions or constructor response questions. Constructor response questions can be computational uh, or they can be qualitative. Um, we're never gonna ask you to draw a graph. We're gonna never ask you to um, create a visual image. It'll either be, you know, write that, you know, uh, execute a formula and show us what the, the answer would be on that, or it would be, you know, describe something, define something, apply your knowledge of this and write it out. And um, you know, Miriam may have already mentioned this, but it's worth reiterating. We're not testing whether or not you can spell. We're not testing whether or not you have good grammar. Uh, we're not even testing if you can write in complete sentences. Uh, if you want to put bullet points, uh, we're totally fine with that as long as you satisfy uh, uh, the needs of that particular question. And some of them may be theoretical questions where it's like, uh, asking you to discuss uh, a certain um, uh, finance theory or concept that was in the curriculum. It could also be very much just, hey, apply your understanding of this and, and you know, decide, you know, choose between these two things and explain why you made that decision or so forth. So uh, there is no um, uh, rule as to what is going to be in the constructive response. But what I can say definitively is that uh, it's either going to be something written or a calculation. We're definitely not going to ask you to to draw anything or, or graph anything uh, in that regard. Um, and we're certainly not going to be penalizing you for spelling, grammar, or sentence construction. Um, so long as we can read it <laughs> uh, and uh, understand it, um, uh, then then that's what we're looking for. Really interesting one on our relationship with regulators and the and the uh, regulators use of Kaya as a waiver. Uh, so we don't we don't have nor maybe ironically would I ever suggest that regulators require Kaya to practice. But what we do have is a, is a few examples of regulators that accept Kaya in lieu of or as a waiver for their local provincial security exam to practice. So Peru is one uh, that comes to mind. Canada is another where there are uh, uh, certain examinations and, and learning programs that also can help achieve licensing requirements in those certain countries. That is something we're trying to proliferate and improve as regulators around the world become more familiar with Kaya. Um, so we are still somewhat early in that process, but yes, that is that is starting to happen as we get more recognized and, and as Kaya charter holders proliferate, as I said, the more folks that have this, the more likely regulators will be willing to waive uh, licensing exams uh, for Kaya. Um, I put the study calculator in the chat. Actually, for those of you who are trying to figure out the exams are in September, um, right now it's April. If I were to put 250 or 300 study hours in my work life balance, where, where would I need to focus on my studies? I highly recommend that you check that tool out and see if the September exam is feasible. Um, Stephen, I have a question for you. Each year the curriculum is updated 
When is that released and what exam, subsequent exams does it cover? Um, sometimes we have people who use curriculum from three years ago and that it doesn't work that way. Sure. Yeah, uh, good, good point. So we think about um, our curriculum existing within a single calendar year. So we have two exams uh, cycles each year, one in uh, March and one in September. Um, the curriculum for that March and September exam cycle will be the same. Uh, and then the next year, we will have revisions to our curriculum. Um, uh, when you sign up for the exam, you know you you receive our curriculum uh, digitally, and so you will always have the freshest or latest uh, curriculum at your fingertips when you register. Uh, if you're somebody who has purchased a print edition, uh, it'll be the case that in the subsequent calendar year, uh, it will be. Uh, a little bit out of date. Uh, certainly, many of those pages will still be the same. It's not like we literally rewrite the entire thing every single year, but we do revise, we do add, we do remove. And so you are at a disadvantage if you try to use a historical print edition to prepare for the exams. Um, but the good news is, is that everybody receives the digital uh, edition when they register. And so you'll always have uh, the latest material um, you know, one thing I guess to add to what you brought up then, Miriam, though, is let's say, for example, you take the exam in the September cycle and do not pass and look to retake it the next year in the March cycle, you will actually be using um, a new edition of the curriculum. Whereas if you take it in the March cycle and pass and then look to retake it in September, you would be using the exact same uh, material. Um, so that is just one thing to point out uh, that that candidates have to consider. And for those of you that have English as a second language, I'm one of those. Um, we see some of our candidates skip the March exam. They purchase the print material in October when it becomes available, and they just have a, they need a longer ramp up time to sit for the September exam. You have that opportunity to do that. Use that study calculator and see how you can. Um, amplify that to um, help you with your studies. Uh, there's a question about the CFA Code of Ethics that is uh, uh, integral part of our level one um, material. Um, we, we There are learning objectives again associated with that. And so as you read through the Code of Ethics, that um, uh, will be suitable for you to master those learning objectives. Uh, important point is that you have to go grab that code of conduct separately. It's not uh, most willing for it. It is not printed with our curriculum. It's not on the digital component. Uh, that is a material that you can go to our website and download separately. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, but yes, that is, uh, it is again, self-contained uh, and reading through that will be more than enough to uh, master the learning objectives associated with it. Um, and at this time, there, there's the following question, is there a focus on how it's applied to alts? Uh, there, at this time, there is not a follow-on application element of it, if you will, it is, is a self-contained uh, document. Yeah, and I think I think just to underscore what Steve said, again, the learning outcomes are going to tell you exactly the, what you need to know, what we're expecting you to understand when you read it and study it, and therefore how you are meant to prepare for the exam. We do not, to your question, we do not take license and kind of uh, apply knowledge to a separate situation that we have not explicitly told you within a learning outcome. So you can rest assured there, uh, we take no liberty and certainly we're not attempting to, to trick you. We are gonna be a, a clear in our learning outcomes what you should know from each of those readings. CFA Code of Ethics is no exception to that. I see one remaining question here in the Q&A uh, and it was, we've touched on it, but I'll just sort of add a little bit context. It's about uh, career progressions for Kaya charter holders. Um, you know, as, as we've mentioned, uh, while the curriculum speaks to the allocator, quote unquote, our audience is anybody who is in the alts ecosystem. And so um, if you look at the our, our membership uh, career distribution, um, it's 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 spread out. It's it's not concentrated necessarily in one area. We have folks who are. Uh, allocators and limited partners. We have folks who are asset owners and general partners. We have folks who are regulators. We have folks who are service providers and, and so forth. Uh, the Kayette Charter 
gives you knowledge of the alternative investment ecosystem. And then it's up to you to decide where within the ecosystem you're interested in participating. And you will just have a growth in your knowledge space there. We do not cater to one specific career path per se. I do want to just reemphasize our curriculum is not designed for people who are looking for learning about how to build a spreadsheet model for some investment. We're not teaching you balance sheets. We're not teaching you income statements. We're not teaching you very, very detailed technical modeling skills. That's somewhere else. Um, but we're teaching you to understand the, diff the variety of the strategies that exist, what the underlying strategy is looking like, how it fits into a portfolio, what the risks are, so on and so forth. Um, and so uh, it's it's a different angle uh, than you might anticipate, but it's a really important angle uh, for folks who are participating in the ecosystem, want to be able to navigate across the ecosystem and not just be somebody who's sitting behind a computer all day doing models and not talking to anybody else. Do you have to pass both levels in one year? Uh, there's no rule around having to do that. Um, it's if you are able to pass level one in March and then sit for level two in September and pass it, awesome. But if you want to take one in March and then wait until March again the subsequent year to take level two, totally fine. Uh, we have people who take a break for more than a year between taking the exams. There's no no rule around that whatsoever. Multiple choice. You know, there's a, there's a whole science uh, and industry around framing and writing appropriate, highly uh, distinctive multiple choice questions, right? Our academic experience for most of us was a lesson in really poor question writing. And I would like to think that Kaya, amongst other professional designations you might take, takes this much more seriously. There's entire science called psychometrics that is based on writing good questions that really distinguish between those that have mastered the material and those that have not. Um, and we and we have a very robust process to debate, interrogate questions, sample questions before they ever see the light of day on an exam. Why are some phrased in the negative to this particular question, Paul? Uh, some are just much better at distinguishing those that know the material versus not. If you phrase it such as which of the following is not an example of fill in the blank, A, B, or C. So. Uh, you can imagine that uh, that would be a helpful and appropriate way to distinguish um, someone's understanding. Uh, and, and so that, that can go both ways. Uh, we will use both framing approaches to ensure that we get at the underlying mastery question. Uh, so hopefully that helps. There's another good question that I, I, would, I forgot to address earlier, which is uh, while you're taking the exam, any, any, any um, tips? Uh, because you're taking it uh, in, a, in a computerized format, one of the nice things is that you can go back and forth. You're not, you don't have to answer question one before answering question two, and so on and so forth. On at, uh, if you look at the time you have and the number of questions, you're going to have a little bit over one minute per question uh, on average. That doesn't mean that every single question will take you about a minute to answer. Some will be a little shorter. Some might be a little bit longer. There's, there's no question that some of the quantitative questions might take you a few minutes. Uh, to answer. And so um, the, the advice I like to give, again, everyone's different, but the advice I like to give is uh, go through the questions. And if there's one that you get to and you're like, ooh, I'm not really sure about this, or this is going to be a little bit longer, it's okay to skip it and then come back to it at the end. The, the worst thing you can do is get tied up on a question and then spend 20 minutes trying to answer one question and then get to five minutes left in the exam and have 15 questions left to answer and just wildly guess. It would be better to answer 98 of the questions and have two left at the end that you're not sure about. And maybe you guess on two of them as opposed to having to wildly guess on 15 of them. So there is no rule that says you have to answer question one before you can answer question two before you answer question three. You're welcome to come back. And yes, some questions will take a little longer than others. I would suggest the ones that you can tell right away after reading it will take you a little bit longer. Flag it, come back to it at the end. Do not risk running out of time leaving 10 answerable questions at the end for you to do. Go through the ones you can answer right away and then come back to the ones that are gonna take you a little bit longer to, to work through. Um, we do not have some rule to create questions in a way that everyone takes the same amount of time to answer. Some will be very quick, some will be longer, but on average, you have about a minute for each, um, but that doesn't mean that each one will take you a minute. 
I, I think we've already answered this, but just just for uh, for clarity. So additional help for specific topics, as we've mentioned on our site, and I've included that link in the string of answered questions. We have a list of prep providers that we work with uh, to ensure they've got the access to the curriculum marine outcomes. So I would encourage you to spend time with that. Um, Mira, online version of the test, are you allowed to annotate, annotate highlight on screen? There is a, there's a digital whiteboard, but you, you can't actually manipulate the questions themselves, right? You can bookmark, like Steve said, and come back. Yeah, um, we have, I will follow up with this as well. Um, we have two really great videos by Pearson View that show you your online experience as well as your test center experience. So this ties in not only to what you actually see on the screen, what you see on the screen is the same in each exam. There's no difference. It's your environment is what makes the difference. And so no, you cannot annotate in the exam, but you can flag your questions. I do wanna encourage everyone though, if you decide to sit for either a test center exam or an online exam, to not do it in one of the last two days of the exam window. I know you wanna squeeze in extra study time. You're not really helping yourself. Life happens, you could get sick. If you sit, if you schedule it in the beginning of the window, we still have two whole weeks for you to figure out if you can sit for the exam within the exam window. When the exam window closes, we cannot say, oh, uh, Fred wants to sit for the exam in the third week. We just don't have that availability. Um, the other thing I wanna emphasize is as you register for your exam, we have an entire candidate success team that is here for you to make sure that your success is achieved. We will help you reminding you that you need to download certain material. We will help you remind you that you need to schedule your exam seat. There are so many ways that we can support you. Um, just make sure that you read your emails, but we're here for you. If there is a situation where you need our help, I think one of our best features is that we are always available. We have people during the exam window that freak out because they cannot enter the Pearson View Test Center. And it turns out to be not a really big deal, but we are here for you on the weekends, at night. Email us anytime. Uh, structured response. Um, I, I, I hesitate to speak for CFA. Um, uh, again, they've just shifted to computer-based testing. So historically have been very different um, for obvious reasons, but I can speak to Kaya and that is uh, you know, this, this individual, Adrian, you've asked this really interestingly because you didn't use the word essay. And a lot of times we and all of you use the word essay. And what this is not is what we experienced again back in our academic experience with long drawn out pros. Um, we are looking again, given what we've discussed earlier about explicit learning outcomes, a grading key that we spend a lot of time on that outlines very specifically the, the phrases and the concepts and the answers that we're looking for, we're looking for very punchy answers. Bullet points are great. Incomplete sentences and fragments are okay. The English and the grammar doesn't need to be perfect. Uh, so in that sense, these are, these are, um, these are free flowing answers versus multiple choice, but they are not long drawn out five paragraph essays that have to be, uh, you know, perfectly polished and edited and flowing. Uh, so I hope that I hope that uh, answers the question that those those are the two types on level two is structure response and multiple choice. Steve, did we did we I saw one earlier. Did we specifically state the topics that are eligible for constructive response? Um, uh, why don't you just why don't you just yeah. take that just to be clear? Yep. So level two is again is the only level that has constructive response questions. 30% uh, of the exam weight will be constructed response. It will be the first half of the exam. Um, you are guaranteed to have a constructed response question on emerging topics. And furthermore, emerging topics are only tested via constructed response. You're also guaranteed to have a constructed response question on our uh, ESG uh, regulation and um, ethics uh, section uh, in level two. Similarly, those will those topics are only tested via constructed response as well. 
And then the remainder of the material within the curriculum uh, is eligible to be tested via constructor response. So you have two constructor responses that you know exactly where it's coming from. And then the third constructor response is going to come from somewhere within the rest of the curriculum, uh, for better or for worse. That being said, you also know that within the multiple choice section for level two, that you will not be dealing with emerging topics or ethics, ESG, and regulation. Instead, the remainder of the material is tested predominantly through multiple choice and, uh, and, and uh, to a smaller degree through a singular constructed response uh, question. Thank you. Just one last thing uh, as a reminder for folks, if you're signing up for level two, our emerging topics are uh, not embedded in the digital curriculum. You have to go to our website and get those and yeah. download those. Do not forget to do that. If you're signing up for level one, the code of conduct is not embedded in our digital curriculum. You have to go to our website or the CFA Institute website and download that and use that. So uh, every once in a while, someone forgets to get those uh, external links, please make sure you do. They are a part of our curriculum. You are tested on them. Just because they're not embedded in our digital product does not mean that we're not including them. Um, so please make sure that you access those. Maybe the other thing I wanted to close with is just a reminder on fees and timeline. Uh, and Miriam, you can jump in if I don't hit everything. But th there's a really important change, especially for those of you that may have flirted with or been uh, kind of exploring the idea of signing up uh, for this exam. Uh, we have recently not only changed the registration process to include the digital curriculum, as I said a few moments ago, we've significantly lowered the early registration cost for candidates. And that was for two reasons. We wanted to provide more accessibility to what we think is a really important step in your professional journey. That is the Kaya program. We think there's real value here. And if we can encourage and incentivize pe more people to take it, to have more uh, ethical grounding and knowledge and competency, then clients in the world are in a better place. The other thing, however, is that we're really incentivizing, at least attempting to incentivize you to register earlier in the process for a lot of the reasons that you ask good questions on as far as study commitment and rigor and timing. You are going to be a whole lot more likely to be successful in this exam if you start early and really have a deliberate rhythm over a number of months versus try to take that last month and really hit it hard and cram. And so as a result, we are trying to push you with a lower registration for the first eight weeks, we're about two and a half weeks into that first eight weeks, to get in early and get that uh, curriculum in your hands as soon as possible. So we're trying to align ourselves around what is gonna make you most successful, both monetarily and practically. Uh, so I encourage you again, you've still got about five weeks left to take advantage of that much lower cost. Uh, and uh, regardless of the dollars, uh, more importantly, is uh, beginning your, your study program so that you've got a better chance of really internalizing this material, because it's a lot. Uh, we would encourage you to start early. Retake fees have gone up uh, recently simply because we did some benchmarking and we were, um, to be honest, an exception a bit out of bounds. Most uh, credentialing organizations, just speaking frankly, don't have any discount to a retake fee. The registration is the registration. We still think there's, there's reason um, to discount your second or third attempt coming back, but we thought that the level of the difference was uh, exorbitant. So that, that's why we've changed that. And I think I just answered that last one as well. So uh, Miriam, do you want to close us out? I, I guess I'll just close with, you know, I think these are a lot of fun. I love engaging with candidates, members, and those that are thinking about joining those communities. Um, and uh, I, I hope this was helpful. As I said at the beginning, this was not meant to strong arm or push. It was meant to just unveil and make anything that was a mystery a little bit clear and encourage you on your journey of learning and becoming a professional. We hope Kai is part of that, but, uh, but if not, we wish you the best and hope you stay in touch.